This CT scan of the brain is going to get any neurosurgeon's heart racing. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 67-year-old man who came to the emergency department after a fall at home. He's on Eliquis for atrial fibrillation or an irregular heartbeat, and he was in a car accident about a month ago. It was a fairly minor accident, but he did get shook around a little bit, so he went to the emergency department to get checked out, and a trauma scan, including a CT scan of his brain, was performed that was negative, so he was discharged home. About a week or two after the accident, he began to complain of headaches and was not quite acting like himself and was having some short-term memory problems and some balance issues. They began to get progressively worse, so he had called the doctor the morning of his fall and made an appointment to be seen tomorrow. Throughout that day, his headaches got worse and worse and he fell on the floor and couldn't get up, so his family called 911 and he was brought into the emergency department. By the time he got to the ER, he was fairly unresponsive and this CT scan of the brain was done that shows a massive subdural hematoma between his skull and his brain. So let's discuss subdural hematomas and how they can happen even weeks after an accident because this is one of the most commonly seen neurosurgical conditions when I am on trauma call. Elderly patients that are on blood thinners are the most at risk for the development of a chronic subdural hematoma. So let's first discuss the venous anatomy of the brain and why these things happen. Just like every organ in our body, we have arteries that supply blood flow and veins that drain blood flow. This is the structure of the anatomy of how blood drains from our brain. Now, if we zoom in on this, there are these tiny little bridging veins that go between our brain and our skull. Here's a great cartoon illustration from a video that I found on YouTube that illustrates how subdural hematomas can develop. The head undergoes some type of trauma and the brain will rock back and forth inside of the skull. And these little tiny bridging veins that drain the brain can get shifted back and forth from that trauma and can actually tear or shear. See the illustration of how that develops and what happens is bleeding can occur between the brain and the dura called the subdural space. Here you can see blood that's accumulating in that subdural space and over time because this is venous flow or low flow it will grow slowly. Risk factors for development of this type of bleed include older patients because there is less brain volume so the brain can shift around in the skull a little bit more easily and those veins are more susceptible to tearing. And if you are on any type of blood thinning medication, such as Eliquis, like in our patient, the blood will not clot as well. So you'll be more likely to develop a slow ooze without it clotting off. Because the veins are a low flow type environment, that's why that patient's CT scan was normal whenever he was first involved in the car accident. And to be honest with you, that's often the case. Over a period of hours to days to weeks, this subdural hematoma will continue to enlarge over time. Why does it enlarge? Well, we mentioned that the patient is on blood thinner, so the clotting factors within the blood don't work appropriately. And then as this blood clot forms, it almost forms like an osmotic type gradient. The blood actually has a lot of protein, so over time, water will be absorbed into this space and continue to enlarge over a period of time. Now, what we saw on this patient's CAT scan are these little tiny lines here that are called membranes and they are key to making the diagnosis of a subdural hematoma. What happens is that as these subdural collections form, your body almost walls it off or forms like a membrane around that initial collection. And then you may have a rebleed and then another collection forms and walls off again. And then another rebleed and then another membrane forms on top of that. And then you magnify that over a period of days to weeks to even months sometimes and that fluid collection can grow slowly over time. So as the bleeding continues to enlarge, it's pressing on the normal brain, causing headaches. And as it gets bigger, it can cause numbness, weakness, sometimes even seizures from irritating the cortex of the brain. And if it's on the speech dominant side, like on the left side of the majority of patients, you'll even get speech troubles. Now our patient was on the right side, so he began to develop left-sided weakness. That's because the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. And because of this pressure and combined with the weakness, he started to have balance trouble and suffered a fall in his living room 
which prompted a re-bleed in the subdural, causing a rapid decline in his neurological status, which prompted the call to the emergency room and this scan. And what we see on this CAT scan of the brain is a mass of acute on chronic subdural hematoma causing significant compression of the brain, massive midline shift. Here we see the middle of the brain here, which is supposed to be right here. And this is impending herniation of the brain. So this man needs to get to the operating room fast. But doctor, you said he's on blood thinners. Eliquis is an inhibitor of the factor 10A in the blood coagulation cascade. And there is a reversal agent called Andexa that immediately reverses the effects of Eliquis in the blood coagulation cascade. You can also give something called PCC, and that is a blood product that gives your body back clotting factors so your blood can clot better. Then we take the patient to the operating room. Now something kind of cool that I want to point out on this CAT scan is that acute on chronic subdural hematomas often look just like this. The acute or brighter white part of the blood is the newer blood and the dark is the older blood. The newer blood is often at the bottom part of the scan. So do you know why that is? It's because the acute blood is more dense and gravity will pull it down. Because remember, this patient is laying on their back in the CT scanner and this is the back of their head. So the acute blood will often drift down towards the bottom part. Just a little fun fact for you. Now remember the blood that we need to evacuate is not really in the brain, but rather right up under the skull. All we really need to do is drill a couple of holes in the skull to let that blood flow out. Chronic blood or blood that's been there for a little bit is often like motor oil consistency, so it's very liquid. Now blood that's more acute, like within just a few hours, is almost jelly-like, so it's really hard to evacuate with just a single hole. And we often have to do a full craniotomy to remove the entire part of the skull to get that jelly-like collection of blood out. But in cases of chronic subdural hematomas, the treatment is usually fairly easy where we can drill a burr hole and then open the dura or the covering of the brain to let that motor oil-like consistency blood grain out. The one really cool part about neurosurgery is that we have special drills that can automatically stop once they penetrate through the skull, but automatically stop so we don't plummet into the brain. We usually drill two burr holes, one here and one here, to evacuate that clot and then run water in and out between the two holes to completely bathe this part of the brain and evacuate that blood. That's called a burr hole evacuation of a chronic subdural hematoma and they are usually pretty successful. But sometimes the blood can actually reaccumulate in that space that has developed. In other words, once we suck out this clot of blood, it may potentially reaccumulate here. Patients that have had membranes that's developed we know that they've reaccumulated the subdural many times. We usually talk to these patients about a procedure called an MMA embolization or an embolization of the middle meningeal artery. It's actually the artery that supplies that part of the dura that's continuing to ooze. And because this artery only supplies the dura, we can actually stop blood flow to it so it won't continue to re-bleed. And we can do that endovascularly through a procedure called an embolization. As an endovascularly trained surgeon can go through one of the arteries in your body and feed a catheter all the way up into that artery and then place a material within that blood vessel to clot it off. And then it can't re-bleed. And in some cases where the subdural hematoma hasn't really gotten that big, we can treat it solely by an MMA embolization because then the body can naturally resorb the blood on its own and it can go away without surgery. But unfortunately, in our patient, he had a massive subdural, so that had to be evacuated first, followed by the MMA embolization, and he did really well from these procedures. Despite that crazy amount of compression of the brain, most patients after these procedures actually do really well. Within 24 hours, he was awake and talking again. And after a short stay in inpatient rehabilitation, working with physical therapists and occupational therapists, as well as speech therapists, he was almost back to normal within just a few weeks. 
So the key learning point here in this case is that if you take blood thinners and you do sustain a head trauma, you are at an increased risk of developing these delayed hemorrhages. And any symptoms like headache, numbness, weakness, seizures, balance troubles, memory problems should seek immediate medical attention to ensure that you don't have a subdural hematoma. And a CT scan of the brain is an easy test to perform to rule that out. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case as we close out March, which is Brain Trauma Awareness Month.